Good afternoon, universe, and welcome to another episode of Cross Defense, your weekly dose of worldview demolition, breaking down the stronghold bad opinions and false notions of the enemy, and setting up shop with the mighty fortress of our Lord's Word. I'm your host, Jonathan Fisk, and we are on a journey of imagination into the truth of Christian dogma, believing that God's Word is not dull. It is not boring. When God speaks, he speaks to enliven, to quicken, to inspire in the best sense of the term, to wake us from the dead with the power to actually speak back to him what we have heard, to uh, hear it, retain it, have it transform our minds, have it conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and to confess, to same say these words again. That's why St. Paul encourages us to hunger for the truth and to watch our life and doctrine closely because the threat of the enemy is to send in a massive world that doesn't want to put up with sound doctrine, but instead wants to teach us to suit our own passions and teach us, therefore, to gather our own teachers who will scratch our itching ears for us. But Christianity is about holding firmly the trustworthy message as it has been taught in Scripture and so to encourage others. We're doing this by letting Dr. Francis Pieper classic teacher of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, inspire us with his Christian dogmatic series, Volume 1. We've been working our way through it, knowing that when the truth exists, it always exists the same in every place. And so what he said is what was true then, and it's true now. The scriptures don't change their message. And so we're looking at these words, trying to find in them a way to be challenged to reassess and confess again in our own present day. To help me with that, on the line today, we have regular guest, Pastor Matthew Gunia. He is pastor of Ascension Lutheran Church in Niles, Illinois, classmate of mine from Concordia St. Louis Seminary, class of 2006, and, and a good friend as well. And we're going to be looking at Dr. Pieper's Christian Dogmatics, Volume 1, starting at page, oh, I just lost, I can't turn one page at one time here, page 78, near the bottom where there's a, a number one, and going through most of the next page and a half there. This is in the segment that is called Law and Gospel Under Divisions of Christian Doctrine. He's going to have a lot more to say about law and gospel later in the, the dogmatic series, but he's setting it up here as a major way about how we are to understand doctrine, understand truth. We got three things, law and gospel, fundamental, non-fundamental, open questions, and theological program, uh, problems. The big thing that we're focused on at the start, though, is law and gospel, because it's what teaches us how to see what we do see in the scriptures. In fact, as Dr. Walther once said, if you don't know law and gospel, the scriptures are a closed book to you. So again, today we're kind of picking up on his digging into this law and gospel as a way to read the scriptures idea. And, uh, but let me go ahead and say hello to Pastor Gunia, too. I've been talking, he's sitting there in the wings. Pastor Gunia, welcome back to Cross Defense. It's been a little while. Oh, yeah, it has been. Good to hear from you again, Jonathan. So what are your thoughts? I mean, did, as you were, as you were, I don't want to put you on the spot, but as you were doing your, your looking at today, what are your thoughts? Anything about the section 78, page 78, above what we're going to be reading that you want to kind of bring to bear? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to just jump into law and gospel. Um, I'm going to let you leave the thing because you get paid to do this. That's what I get paid to do. All right. <laughs> we're good then. So my, my thoughts mainly are, are this. I think it's interesting that as what we're going to look at today in, in these bullet points, he's going to give us sort of the three uses of the law as ways for understanding law and gospel. And I find that fascinating because so often in the confessions when we talk law and gospel, we, we talk about the gospel instead. And here he's really focused on putting the law in its, in its proper place. And so I think this is sort of a way of also understanding if we're looking at the bigger picture of Christian dogma, of, of doctrine, of how we what we believe and what we don't believe to realize that law and gospel helps us categorize these things in ways to hear them. So uh, what, do I, what do I mean when I say that? I mean that the doctrine of the Trinity is not intended to be a law for us to follow, uh, but it certainly lands in a realm in which it's something we're not allowed to change, right? And it has a certain function. And, and so to, to keep that in one segment, but then to also see that the, the law of Christian life, of sanctification, of new obedience, that's in a different place. And that how these things relate to each other is going to inform basically the way we approach every other theological question that we have. So, is that a good starting point? I think that's a great starting point. Uh, Peeper, a little bit later on in our text, is going to call these exact opposites. Um, I, I, I would say that, yeah, they are opposites, but they're all the Word of God, and they both have different functions. We're talking about the function of the law today. So, as you say that, and, and uh, I'll try to one more question, we'll go to the actual text. Yep. 
but you say they are actual opposites. So one of the ways I've said this before, and I want, I want to get your thoughts on it, is that Scripture has two words, two words that have, I don't want to say nothing to do with each other. That's not quite right. But if you take them next to each other, you can actually think, well, the Scripture is contradicting itself here. And and yes, except for no, because they have different, again, functions, different uses in a sense, and really this idea that the gospel predominates. But this can be re- very jarring for somebody who's used to reading the, the scriptures as sort of like a book of Proverbs where they're just all true, equally true, every statement kind of stands on its own, to come along and say, look, there's really these two different messages, and you gotta you got to be able to set them against each other a little bit. Uh, this can be a, a new idea. Well, yeah, you are right. There are two uh, different messages. There's the law and there's the gospel, and they're both equally true, and you read one in light of the other. It is absolutely true that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is also equally true that Jesus died to forgive those sins. So am I still a sinner? Yes, I am. Am I still forgiven? Yes, I am. Scripture has many truths that if you take them and put them next to each other, they look like opposites. But all things hold together in Christ. Uh, As other examples, Jesus is true God, 100%. Jesus is true man, 100%. Well, how can you have 200%? Uh, You can't do that. But um, although these may look like opposites, they all hold together in Christ. Right. So what we at seminary, they talked about having these things in tension. Yeah, you don't want to deny either one of them. You want to uphold them both. And the tension is where faith happens, where you put a little trust in God's ability to see what you cannot see. All right. So, again, Dr. Pieper's Dogmatics, Volume 1, page 78. Near the bottom, you'll see a number one. That's where we're picking up as he's going to explain, again, law and gospel as a a way of assessing theology itself. So he says, according to God's will and order, as set down in Scripture, which he's already spent a lot of time establishing, Scripture's where we go, the knowledge of sin must be taught from the law, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20, while the remission of sins or justification must be taught solely from the gospel, for Quote, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28. Same book, same chapter, a little bit later. Whoever teaches that forgiveness is obtained by observing the law is no Christian theologian, but a deceiver who de- seduces men away from Christianity. For, quote, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Galatians 5.4. The evil work of such calls forth the imprecation of the apostle, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you, Galatians 5, 12. It follows that the law by which the knowledge of sins is produced must be preached to the self-righteous and secure sinners, to those who will not acknowledge that they deserve God's wrath and eternal damnation. Now, he's going to continue on there, but I want to go back and pick this up a little more. Because, again, notice how, like I was saying earlier, he's going to talk about law and gospel, but he's really emphasizing the work of the law at this point. And this first just initial idea is revolutionary. I mean, this was very much Luther's Reformation Revolution, pulled from Paul, but Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin, right? That, That the law comes and it increases the trespass. This is just not the way, not only that the evangelical American Christian world handles the law, it's not the way humans handle the law, right? Well, absolutely. Um, I think that last time I was on, I gave the ice cream example from my own life, where uh, I never really had much of a taste for ice cream, take it or leave it, until I went to my doctor and he told me, you can't have ice cream anymore. Uh, From that point on, I really wanted ice cream uh, because it was withheld from me. Uh, That is one function of the law. Well, not not function of the law that is given by God, but our sinful nature reacts to the law that way. If it's withheld from us, we want to chase after it. Now, how do I know that's bad? Because God, in his word, tells me that certain things are bad. Uh, Paul, in, uh, in the epistles, uses coveting. He wouldn't have known what coveting is if the law had not said, Thou shalt not covet. But once he heard, Thou shalt not covet, it produced in him all kinds of covetousness. It convicted Paul with the knowledge that he truly is a sinner in need of salvation in Jesus Christ. One of the things that reminds me of is it's been a little while since this happened in my life, but I was I was hanging at a dinner table with my kids, and at the time they were in public school. And they had one of them had been given the the homework assignment to think about being mayor for a day of the little town we were living in, and, and what they would do if they were mayor for a day. And my my daughter had said, 
No, I would make a law so that I don't remember what it was. It was like don't litter or you know something really, really you know nothing wrong with it. But like I'm gonna make this law that people won't do this one thing. And you might you might as well just put in like won't be mean to each other. And so I asked her. I said, well, well so then after you make this law and you've, you've passed it, then what? Is everyone just gonna do it? And she kind of looked at me and said, I don't know. I said, well, what are you going to do about people that don't do it? Well, I guess I'll have to have the police go and make them do it. And I said, well, is that going to make everybody do it? And she said, no. And, and the point here, what, what I was really trying to get her see to see is that the law doesn't actually make righteousness. Like it can sometimes curb wickedness, but it doesn't change who we are. And so if whether it's man's law attempting to kind of manipulate our hearts into not littering or whatever it was, or whether it's God's laws, strictly saying, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is it doesn't bring with it the capacity to do it. And all you end up doing instead is creating one more thing to basically beat <laughs> beat us over the head with and give us guilt. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how many of your listeners love the speed limit? Uh, huh. I don't think anyone loves the speed limit. Um, but um, we have the, the law, and the law produces outward compliance, usually. Um, if I see that there's a cop somewhere in the neighborhood, I will do the speed limit. My heart's not in it. It doesn't change my heart. I don't say, man, I love the speed limit. But the law can create outward compliance, you go through the motions. Um, but looking at the heart is where you see that you are truly a sinner. Because even if you are doing aspects of the law, you're not doing it out of love for the law. You're doing it out of love for self or for self-preservation or because they get something out of it. I think Dr. Pieper's point here again is really to drive home as we begin to understand the proper distinction between law and gospel, that they, the foremost thing the law is to be expected to do in our lives is show us this sin. It does do other things too, but it's going to bring you knowledge of sin. Meanwhile, if we are going to believe on the Lord in a positive way with a true and a living faith, that's only going to happen because we are given the gospel of justification. And everything else he's going to say is going to flow from, from that reality, these two words. You shall not, oops, I guess I do, that means I'm bad, and Jesus has, which is a totally different thing. For you, this has been accomplished. Yeah, that is, uh, again, you're absolutely right. I'm glad that we're tracking. I'm glad that you come around to my way of thinking so often, uh, <laughs> Pastor Fisk. Um, yeah, I got nothing to add. Okay, so, again... Uh then he, then when he he kind of brings these fighting words in that next sentence, and again, this is part of what I've read already, but he talks about you know that that somebody who would teach a different gospel, namely that forgiveness of sins doesn't come as a free gift, he calls such a person no Christian theologian, but a deceiver who seduces men away from Christianity. And while I think anybody who sat in a Galatians class, and he's, you know, he, he quotes Galatians next, Galatians 5, 4, you know, the good Christian, the good Lutheran kind of knows this, it's still pretty stunning language, right? That, that anybody who would stand up and meddle with just a little bit, you know, just a hair's breadth of self-justification into the Christian theology is effectively here called a deceiver and, and uh, uh, a contributor a contributor to anti-Christian reality. Um, and those are fighting words for our present age, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, is the gospel enough? Uh, that's what it comes down to. And we all say, oh, yeah, the gospel's enough. Jesus has done it all. But uh, we all act as if it's not enough. Well, what do Christians do? Christians go to church. Christians pray. And you can make the list of what Christians should be doing. And if you're not doing it, well then, are you really a Christian? Um, have you really accessed the faith that Jesus offers to you? And so what are you doing? You're not looking at the cross. You're looking at your works. Have I prayed hard enough? Have I attended worship as frequently as I should? Have I given enough to the church? Um, so yeah, anyone who's trying to add things for you to do in order to access what Jesus has done for you, that is not a Christian doctrine. And some congregations, some church bodies, some teachers have done this formally. You must do this, you must pray that prayer, whatever it may be, in order to access the blood of Christ. Others do it in their own minds. They trick themselves. They, they look at uh, other people's piety or their own piety, and they either pat themselves on the back, hey, I've done it, I've done the proper things to access the blood of Christ, and I am forgiven, or they terrify themselves and condemn themselves. Oh, I'm never going to be good enough for Jesus to accept and, and bring into heaven and to forgive and love. 
And it's because the conscience gets so destroyed by this kind of commingling, this confusion of the law as if it were good news, that St. Paul eventually says, you know, I would rather people who teach us away, such a way will just leave Christianity altogether. He actually says it in a much more mean way. I would that they were cut off so they would no longer trouble you. We'll pick it up right there on the other side of this break. You listen to Cross Defense. We'll be right back. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Join Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and congregations across the country as we celebrate Refugee Sunday, a time to lift up the gifts that migrants and refugees bring to our country and to reflect on Christ's message to welcome the stranger. Together, we can continue the mission of welcoming, embracing, and empowering newcomers. Visit lirs.org slash kit to download the Refugee Sunday kit for your congregations, including worship guides, bulletin inserts, videos, and more. lirs.org slash kit. This week on Issues Etc., it's National Lutheran Schools Week. We'll discuss progressive education versus classical Lutheran education with Dr. Thomas Korchak of Concordia University, Chicago. We'll cover topics like method-driven education, socialization, technology in the classroom, the role of the teacher, and teaching worldviews. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. You hear our voices every day as we speak the gospel, share the latest news, or for insightful and sometimes entertaining talk. Why not share your voice with us and send us your feedback, suggestions, and questions? Leave your comment at 314-996-1542. Be sure to follow us on social media, too, so you can like, comment, and share your favorite posts. Drop an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or send a snail mail letter to Worldwide KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. Worldview demolition for the purpose of laying the foundation, which is the gold, the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ crucified for you. You listen to Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Jonathan Fisk, and we've got Pastor Matt Gunia on the line, good friend of mine, looking at Francis Pieper's Christian Dogmatics, Volume 1 on Law and Gospel, page 78 and following. We're actually on to page 79 now, where Paul continues by saying, like, it follows from the fact that the law brings us a knowledge of our sin, that the law is to be preached to the self-righteous and the secure sinner, to those who will not acknowledge that they deserve God's wrath and eternal damnation. And how can you say this, Dr. Pieper? Well, because Paul says this in Romans 3.19. We know, says the apostle, that what things soever the law says, saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The gospel, on the other hand, should be preached to those whom the law has humbled and who therefore are contrite and brokenhearted and poor in spirit. The spiritual conditions of the person dealt with determines when the law and when the gospel is to be applied. Now, this is certainly part of what we all were uh, were encouraged to read in, in CFW Walther's Law and Gospel, which, by the way, uh, listener, you can pick up a copy yourself from Concordia Publishing House, or you can look for the old abridgment, God's No and God's Yes, which I think is actually a great place to start. So this is familiar language, but we got to be careful here as well, because what we don't want to think is that, Dr. Pieper is saying you only preach the gospel to people who are uh, uh, kind of uh, spiritually showing their sin or, or showing an awareness of the sin. And you only preach the law to people who are hardened in their hearts in terms of sermons, right? Because you would never have a sermon that would be all gospel or a sermon that would be all law. He's talking about spiritual care of individuals and their consciences at a particular time and place. Does that sound about right, Pastor Gunya? Yeah, um, there are many ways that pastors care for people. The formal way, the public way, is in the sermon in church on a Sunday morning or or Wednesday night or what have you, uh, preaching the gospel, preaching the law from the pulpit in a sermon. Uh, in sermons, it's right to preach the law, 
tell them why they need a savior. And then it's appropriate to point to the savior and what he has done for you. But that's not the only place that pastors care for the members of their flock. Uh, I find that when I am visiting people in their homes or in hospital beds or in, at a funeral home, that's when uh, the law and the gospel is more particularly and precisely applied to people in their station in life and in their time of need. Right. So, so talk about that a little bit. So, so what's he getting at here when he's saying the gospel should be preached to those who are humbled and contrite? So how would you assess that kind of a thing if you're in, a say, a, a, a hospital room? Well, it, there might be things that people say, like, I think that God is punishing me for sins that I have committed in the past, and that's why I'm suffering as I do, or uh, any other such thing where the suffering is a direct result of the sin that I have committed. In such a in such a time, the person already knows that they are a sinner. Uh, they already know that they deserve punishment, and so what you would do is you would proclaim to them the gospel. Yes, you do deserve this and, and more, but Jesus has taken it for you on the cross, and then explain to them their new identity in Christ. You are a beloved child of God. This is this is not the result of some sin that Jesus didn't die for. That you still have to do some pun or some making up for or anything along those lines. And so, in converse, you know, can you? How would you describe a situation where you you come in and you find somebody who is not repentant or not showing an awareness of their sin? You don't have to describe the actual situation, but like, why is it that? preaching the gospel to them by itself without any law might not really have much effect at that point. Absolutely. If someone comes uh, into my office or I, I meet someone uh, wherever it might be, and they think that they are the model Christian, where if you look up righteousness in the dictionary, they got a picture of that person by them, um, I'm not going to do them any good by praising them and saying, oh, yes, Jesus loves you so much. It's true, or the Father is so pleased with you. It's true, but what this person needs to know is humility, uh, humbling himself, that the reason that Jesus came into the world and the reason why you are loved is because you're so rotten. And I, I need to explain to them that you have not kept the law. Explain to them what the law is. Show them in Scripture uh, what God commands and prove to them that they have not done what God commands. Uh, it's only once your repentance can you receive the gospel. Well, that's not a work on your part. You need to recognize that you need a Savior so that you can receive that Savior. Mm. Yeah, so... so the law is there to effectively, again, this is that Romans 3 passage, silence us. It's, it's not there so that we would say, look, I have done all these things. It's there so that we would have our our hearts convicted of the fact that no matter how much we have done, we have still been unworthy in our service. We haven't even done a worthy job of what we ought to do. And that ultimate purpose of the law. It's not that it doesn't curb us. It does, and that's good. But that ultimate purpose of the law to show us our sin is what kind of lays bare the heart so that the gospel of, wait, God loves you anyway, wait, Jesus is the answer to this wrath anyway, so that that can be salved over the conscience at that at that point. Now, he's gonna, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of us here, Pastor Gunia, but I'm going to throw it throw it at us here anyway. He's going to end today by talking about this being the most difficult art, as Luther says. I mean, this has got to be your own experience, too, even as you talk about you know visiting people in hospitals and whatnot. It's not like you walk in and you're like, hey, I know what I'm doing. And like you walk out, you're like, yep, I'd set it all right there, right? It's, it's, it's just not that easy. No, it, it really isn't. It, it's right. It's that what's written that this is one of the most difficult things for a pastor or a theologian to do, uh, because as you correctly said earlier, you directed the conversation back toward the condition of the heart, not so much toward the condition of the outward works, because as we said earlier, if you keep the law, which you're not doing anyway, but do it with a begrudging heart, oh, gee, I suppose I have to do this in order to keep God happy, but my heart's not in it, and I don't like doing this, you don't get credit for it. Um, so looking at the condition of the heart is very important for a pastor to do, and that requires the pastor actually know the people who are in his congregation. Uh, not just seeing someone on a Sunday morning and doing the handshake, hey, nice sermon, pastor, thank you, we'll see you next week. That's not enough for you to discern the condition of the heart. You have to know the people, talk with the people, visit the people, pray for the people. Uh, I know that there are some pastors and some seminarians listening to us right now, and it's very important for you to be a shepherd of your flock and to know each sheep by name and know their condition. And there are also non-pastors who are listening to us, and so for you it's important to reach out to your pastor, let him get to know you so that he can care for you, 
because he can see the condition of your heart. So he knows when to give you the gospel. He knows when to give you the law. Uh, I don't remember where it was that I heard this. There was a time when I was I was in the parish and I was struggling a little bit with with what I was supposed to be doing there. It was particularly there was an individual who just didn't didn't like me much, and then there so there was some some pain in that relationship, some conflict. And another pastor had said, look, you just need to remember that you have gone there to bury him. And it, it was it threw me off. I was like, wait, wait a minute, what? I, I, to bury him? Yeah, like like to be there until he dies and then bury him as a Christian. And your entire task, your entire work of shepherding is to help him die in the faith. That's what you're there for. And you can't do that, like you said, if you don't know who this person is. If you aren't able to walk into that, uh, whatever situation it is that puts them in a deathbed and be able to know what they need to hear at that time. And to see that as the pastoral task, as the work of the, I think the, the old word is the sales orger, right? That the cure of souls. This is the this is why St. Paul calls it a noble task. It's because that's what it's there to do. But in this then, it's it there is something for the laity as well to recognize that that's what the pastor is there to do. He, he's not there to just kind of hold your hand and bring you flowers and say, what a nice, lovely weather day it is outside. He is there to give your soul the law and the gospel that it needs so that on the day when you do face death, it's a day of release and joy for you, knowing where you go to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far than a day of fear and trepidation. You know, what's going to happen? Is God going to judge me? Yada, yada, yada. Thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, your pastor is not your professional friend. Your pastor is there to do a job. And just like your dentist or your lawyer or your accountant, it doesn't. their personality doesn't really count much is can they do the job? Is your lawyer going to give you good legal advice? Is your dentist going to actually know what to do in order to fix the filling? And your pastor, while we all want to love our pastors, it's the same way. He's there to do a job, not to just say things that you want to hear and make you feel good and warm and fuzzy inside. Um, and the, a lot of the work of a pastor is what you say, preparing you for a blessed death. I say this to the, my confirmation students, and don't tell anyone, but I really don't like teaching confirmation class, uh, going through the small catechism, making kids memorize things, things along those lines. But somewhere in confirmation class, the question always comes up, why are you making us memorize the Lord's Prayer or the Creed or what have you? And my answer is always the same. It's because I'm preparing you to die. Hmm. When you are uh, suffering from Alzheimer's or when everything is falling apart around you, when you know the end is near, I want you to still have the creed right there at your fingertips, right in the forefront of your mind. I want you to know how to pray. Pray the Our Father. When you get communion for the last time, I want you to know that this is the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So I make you memorize it, and I drill it in your head, and we say these things in worship week after week after week, and I repeat them from the pulpit. And if you had a teacher in grade school or high school, and they kept repeating the same thing over and over again, the capital of Illinois is Springfield, the capital of Illinois is Springfield, over and over, when they give you the test, guess what's probably going to be on there? <laughs> the most important thing. So you would do well to remember the most important thing, and this is much bigger than a geography test. This is eternal life. You're not going to get tested at the gates of heaven like St. Peter stands there and like quizzes you on the catechism or anything along those lines. But we want the most important things in your life at the forefront so that we can give you a blessed death and proclaim this one believed. I know this one believed. Hmm. I love that. And I love your, your pointing out that liturgy is the daughter of repetition, and repetition has is the mother of learning, right? If I can mix my metaphor that a little bit there. That, that to have things in the service repeated is a, is a grand strength in an age, in an era where even the best science can't stop us from sometimes losing our minds before we die. And and the, the practical reality that the things that you've remembered the most often are the things you're going to forget last. And I've heard these stories from, from various pastors who are, you'll go in and, and they'll they'll be dealing with somebody who's forgotten everything else. They've forgotten their children's names, but they can still pray the Lord's Prayer every single time. It's pr pretty powerful stuff there. Moving forward now, okay, so he's Dr. Pieper's established for us that law and gospel is an important thing. The law condemns, that the gospel saves, but now he's going to talk about the law doing something else, and, and that this is important for understanding theology as a whole. 
that the law is the only source from which the Christian theologian teaches what good works are. Oh, oh it's just, I, I just I love that right there. I'm going to come back and say something about that. I'm going to read some more first. E- even as Christ himself pointed to the law when he answered the question, which works are commanded by God and are therefore God pleasing in Matthew 15, 22, 19, Christians too need the law in this respect. For because of their old Adam, they are prone to take commandments of men, such as commandments concerning meat and drink, celibacy, yada, yada, etc., to be commandments of God. But the law cannot produce the works which are commanded by God and are good in his sight. Now he's kind of going back to the former point. The Christian theologian knows and ever bears in mind that only the gospel can create in man the will and strength to do good works. The apostle knew of no other way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Uh, the axiom, lex prescribit, evangelium inscribit. I don't know how to translate that. The law of prescription, the gospel of inscription, something like that. Uh, Or Luther, a quote from Luther here. The lawmonger compels by threats and punishments. The preacher of grace persuades and incites men by setting forth the goodness and mercy of God. Learn to preach the gospel, and you've learned the art of making your people zealous of good works. Now, there's a point to probably go off on there a little bit that Okay, so the law can't actually compel us to do what it says we ought to do. The gospel, marvelously enough, gets us to do the good works without having to compel us to do it. But before we get there, his main point in this segment is really what he was saying in the first half. And and this is what I want your thoughts on again then, Pastor Gunya. So that there's a tendency to want to create our own good works to justify ourselves, which are not the good works that the scriptures actually teach. And we hunger more by our sinful condition for the fake good works, for the made-up good works that we think are more glorious or more beautiful or or more justifying than for the actual good works of the Ten Commandments that are given in the law of God. And the, 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 the Christian theologian, the preacher, the teacher, and even the Christian are to strive to not teach a law that God has not given, to not actually create laws, but instead to seek after the ones that we've been given in the Ten Commandments. To me, that speaks really, really strongly because I just, I feel like when I look around American Christianity today, I see all manner of laws that are not the Ten Commandments. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and uh, this convicts me as well. I remember growing up, I don't know why or where this came from, but in my house, you were never allowed to eat meat on Good Friday. Uh, So we, we never had fish either. That was too close to me. So it was all vegetables and potatoes and such. And I remember, I think I was in eighth grade, maybe a freshman in high school. I went to my buddy's house, and it was lunchtime, and his mom made us turkey sandwiches. And I looked at her in horror. What, what are you doing? Today is Good Friday. We're not supposed to eat meat. And she looked at me and said, where does it say that in the Bible? And that's I, the first time I ever ate meat on Good Friday because it doesn't say that in the Bible. This was something that my family made up, and, and I was following it, and I thought this is what Jesus wants me to do. Look how great I am. I am refraining from meat on Good Friday. But that wasn't a good work. But The Bible doesn't call that a good work. I mean, you don't have to eat meat. You don't have to eat vegetables. You can do what you want. You have Christian freedom in this regard. If you want to know what God really wants you to do, You open the Bible and you read it. You see where the law is. You see where the gospel is. You you see how God describes the life that you should be living. What you're getting at there a little bit then, or what this this distinction is getting at, is one that I would call the difference between piety and pietism. Uh, Piety is not a bad thing. To, to, to desire to do good things, right? So that you hear the law of God and you're like, okay, I'm going to apply it here. I'm going to apply it here. Uh, for example, let's just take an easy whipping boy of, of alcohol, right? So you know that drunkenness is bad. And so you decide that in order to make sure that you never become drunk, that you never have a never have a glass of wine, never have a glass of beer ever because drunkenness is bad. You want to avoid it. That's fine. Like There's nothing wrong with that. But then the moment you start saying that everyone else has to follow this pursuit of piety the same way you do. You create a law based on your piety. That's like the definition of pietism, right? Where you have now created kind of sub laws to make sure that we keep the law. This is how the Hebrews, the Pharisees really got to the point where they were making null the word of God for the sake of their traditions, as Jesus said, as they'd created sub laws to make sure that they kept the law. One example was you could only take so many steps on your Sabbath day. And then, you know, I forget what the number was. It was 65 or whatever. So as long as I take 64 steps on my Sabbath, I can do all 
all the stepping that I want. But if I take 66, now I have broken the Sabbath, right? Well, what they you can see their piety was like, look, we don't want to work on the Sabbath. This is a way to avoid working on the Sabbath. We'll try to kind of limit how much we do, but then they went and they turned it into a means for assessing their righteousness, right? Whereas if you want to assess your righteousness, first off, the law is going to condemn you no matter what. But second, let's stick with the real law. You can't perfectly keep the Sabbath. You can't actually rest in full faith and trust in God, even for a single moment, let alone a whole day, right? So to recognize that and to not uh, or just set ourselves against creating these rules, even though the temptation is always there to do so. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, you said it very well. I was going to go down the route of piety and pietism, but I thought that might be a rabbit hole. I'm glad that you decided to go down that road. Yeah, and this is nothing new. Uh, Christians have been doing this since the ascension of Christ, where we are putting, we're making up laws in order to live a righteous life, but then somehow we twist that in our mind, and we start judging other people by the laws that we made up well, you're not as good as me or as that other person because you use your Christian liberty in a way that I choose not to use my Christian liberty. And it causes divisions, all kinds of horrible divisions. Um, it, keeping the law is good. Living a righteous and holy life is good. But to take your piety and the way that you are going to set up boundaries for your life and demand that everyone follow the boundaries that you have set up for yourself uh, no, that's pietism, and, and that's where you are rightly condemned if someone calls you out on that. Yeah, yeah. And so this is where, again, point two is is for all of us as Christians, and pastors especially then, to strive to preach the law as the law, but not to make up ways to keep it, right? Uh, we can encourage ways to keep it, but to let the law itself be the definer of good works. What, what do you make of this quote that he ends with the segment here with, with Luther? The lawmonger compels by threats and punishments. The preacher of grace persuades and incites men by setting forth the goodness and mercy of God. I mean, is he just being an antinomian there and, and saying that, that Christians don't need the law? <laughs> well, I, I will say that lawmonger is one of my new favorite words. It's got to be, doesn't one. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a common trap. I mean, we all, as pastors, want our people to live lives that are that are holy lives. We want them to live righteous lives. Now, if I'm going to convince them to do that, I can go one of two ways. I can threaten them with fire and brimstone. You better do this. Threat of the law. Um, you will be rejected by Christ if you continue to hang on to the sin and do not repent of it. Um, well, that might get outward compliance again, but it's not going to change the heart. And it's very likely that people are going to throw up their hands and say, I can't do everything that my pastor is telling me to do. Well, I guess Jesus just isn't going to have to love me. Uh, the other way I could do it is by telling them first what Jesus has done for them. He forgives you of all of your sins. And now you're free to live a righteous and holy life. This is what a holy and righteous life might look like. And you go back to the law and describe what the life looks like in accordance with the law. And then people, because of their joy and gladness, want to actually do the things that Jesus, their Savior, has instructed them to do. Uh, I guess, like, um, to use a word that's, um, or to use a phrase that doesn't use the word lawmonger, it's, uh, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, hmm. but you create more righteousness by the preaching of the gospel than by the preaching of the law. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, another example kind of comes to mind that it, it falls apart a little bit because it's going to involve rewards for what you do, but I think it kind of still demonstrates the point. I remember hearing somebody talk about once, you know, if because it's going back to the speed limit thing you mentioned earlier again, right? No one likes the speed limit. Imagine if instead of getting pulled over for going over the speed limit and getting charged three hundred dollars, every day the cops are going around with their their laser gun and they were picking you know cars and then randomly one car that's going the speed limit, they were going to get the license and then they send a three hundred dollar check in the mail. Thank you for going the speed limit. Now it it might not get everybody to to follow the speed limit, but it might kind of change a few hearts about it, right? Like it might get you to think, man, the speed limit is something I'd love to do because it has positive benefits to me, right? And granted, again, you can you can really turn this around and make it into a, a reward and a law based thing, but the idea is again that the the promise of something in the future, the promise of something good, I should say, or the reality of something good being given has a greater effect upon the heart, if it's actually going to change the heart, than a command or, or a mandate is ever going to do. We got one more point here he's going to make now in this setting up of law and gospel as a place for understanding theology. Point three, we're on the bottom of page 79. Dr. Pieper says, 
The Christian theologian knows, too, that is also, that he cannot successfully combat sin by means of the law. That's kind of what Pastor Gunya just said a moment ago. The law can indeed check sin outwardly, but inwardly it only activates and multiplies sin. This is what I was saying earlier about the, the law can curb you, but inwardly it, it can't even curb you. It just exacerbates it. It makes it worse. It's like poking a bruise. Paul speaks from experience. He says, quote, For when we were in the flesh, that is under the law, the motions of sin were, which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death, Romans 7, 5. It is the gospel alone which slays sin in man. Quote, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That's Romans 7 verse 6. And Romans 6 14 declares, quote, sin shall have no dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now he gives us some more Latin. We'll see how I can do. Lex necet peccatorum non peccatum. Evangelium necet peccatum non peccatorum. Uh, oh man, I don't know about that one. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to guess. Therefore, he, he quotes uh, from Dr. Luther again here, I think. Therefore, place him who is well versed in this art of dividing the law from the gospel at the head and call him a doctor of holy writ. And that's sort of the, the highest art bit we were talking about earlier. So a lot there in Romans 7 or Romans 6, kind of the place to go for this theology in the scriptures to, to wrestle with law and gospel as a Christian is to understand Romans chapter 7. Uh, what are your initial thoughts just from that paragraph, Pastor Gunia? No, it's a lot of repeat from number two. Uh, you can't combat the law by making more laws. So, okay, with, the, uh, with that then... How do we overcome that reality? Like, I mean, so in my own heart, how do I teach myself to not do that? Any thoughts? Well, you know, the, we, we talked about the one of the paradigms. I, I want to make sure that I keep the Sabbath day holy, and I'm going to make sure I don't work, so we're going to have a prescribed number of steps. Uh, but then uh, you have to have another law on top of that, so you have another law to help you keep the law to keep the law, and then you have to have another one on that. And, and all of it is works-based, all of it is fear-based. There's always that nagging thought, have I really done enough? Is God really pleased with me yet? Uh, the Gospel doesn't even ask those questions. The Gospel proclaims, God loves you through Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done with you. It showers you with peace and joy and confidence. You don't have to worry about whether Jesus loves you or not, or am I doing enough or not. Those are not even questions that come to mind. But rather, because Jesus loves me, I can go off and do good works. Um, I just totally... You, oh, man, I was just thinking like three things at once. Okay, so... <laughs> Is the gospel? He says, it "Is the gospel alone which slays the sin in man?" And and I think that's also worth kind of pulling out here, so that we like to think of sin as being the bad things we do, breaking the law, and so we think of always fifth commandment, sixth commandment, seventh commandment, eighth commandment, right? Murder, adultery, theft, and lies. Like that's the thing. That's sin. But it's easy to forget that the first three commandments and the fourth commandment, kind of tied into it about authority, are are about trying to have other gods beside God, and ultimately that means trying to justify ourselves, trying to, to create in ourselves a place where I can look in the mirror and say, you're okay, and, you know, golly gee, pe people really like you because you're, you're a fine chap, Jonathan Fisk, and it is the gospel which actually kills that sinful pride by forgiving it, <laughs> by, by saying there is no work in you, no thing in you you can do, which is enough to satisfy God at all. I forgive you. It is the forgiveness itself which destroys me in terms of my pride and my self-justification. And in this is where the gospel alone, is this is his language, slays the sinful man, right? Slays the sin in you by promising you that there's another man who is Jesus working upon you to raise you from the dead. And I, I, did, I, did that make sense, what I just said there? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm tracking with you. Okay. Thoughts about it? <laughs> <laughs> Aside from I agree, um, you know what, I, I'm thinking, I topped you, I'm thinking four thoughts at the same time. So, uh, the number one rule of radio is just keep talking. So, yes. I will do that. <laughs> Uh, and by saying, what are your thoughts? My, my, my thoughts are we skipped our second break, and so I'm trying to move the end music up to the front while, while you talk to me. That's all right. We got it. So um, I want to look at Luther's quote here again from um, 
from the back of this paragraph because it's easier said than done. Like he, he says this and it's it's profound and it's beautiful and it's like, oh yeah, everyone agrees. Like therefore, place him who is well-versed in the art of dividing law from gospel at the head and call him a doctor of holy writ. That's great. Let's all do that. But again, just like walking into the hospital room and rightly distinguishing the state of a soul, easier said than done. I mean, how do we even go about trying to make or apply that that sentence. I mean, if you just want to talk about, you know, how true it is, I'm, I'm good with that too. But I struggle. Like, how do we do this? Oh, yeah, it, absolutely. Every time I go to, to someone's home or, or to the hospital room or where have you, where, wherever, uh, I do worry about uh, how I'm going to approach this person or this situation. Am I going to properly diagnose the condition of the soul? Uh, but that's even from there a law-based way of looking at it. If it's going to be, it's up to me, and, and that's not what it is. I have to continually remind myself that in our in the mutual conversation of the brethren, as I pray with the person, as we speak about the law, as we speak about the gospel of Jesus Christ, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is in those words to guide and direct the conversation, uh, to convict or to raise up the person with whom I speak. So one of the ways I'm thinking about this, I, I'm totally in agreement with you there, but it's also like, so for the average lay person, what does it mean to place at the head one who is uh, a doctor of law and gospel, right? And this is like, the next time you're in a situation where you have to call a pastor, the primary question you should have for all the candidates that you interview is, is this guy able to rightly distinguish law and gospel? Or the next time you're going to be at a district convention and vote for the, the secretary of this, that, and the other thing, or, or the, the mission of this, mission executive of this, that, or the other thing, or the president, right, or the president of Senate, or any of the motions at Senate that take place. The, the thing that should be driving all of our decision making is, are we rightly distinguishing law and gospel? Will this person in the vocation that we're sending them as church rightly distinguish law and gospel? And, and if the answer is no, well, then we need to uh, we need to take a step back and think twice. Yeah, because if we don't, if we don't, if we put into the voice of the church individuals who cannot tell the difference between this is what God has said is a good work and you really should do this work, but it doesn't save you, and Jesus Christ crucified you is a done deal, promised, here sealed in your baptism, don't you dare doubt it. If you can't distinguish between those two things, it doesn't matter what else we do and call it mission, it doesn't matter what else we do and call it church, it's all, it's all a house of cards. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that as well. Now, this is the question, does this person rightly distinguish law and gospel? The answer for everyone is, no. Ha, explain that. That's we, good. That's good. You know, no, we all make mistakes. We all misdiagnose. Uh, me, you, every pastor I know has thought they were supposed to zig with the gospel, but really they were supposed to zag with the law, and, and the words that you spoke fell short. And then you walk back to your car thinking, ah, oh, how silly could I have been? Um, every pastor does that. And look at this. The Church is still standing anyway. Uh, Jesus is still present in the Word and in the sacraments. He, he continues to forgive even pastors when they misapply the law and the Gospel. Um, so it's not so much the question is, is this person going to be a perfect pastor and do exactly what, what the Holy Spirit would have him do and properly diagnose every heart that he comes across? Uh, no one can possibly do that. But does this pastor work hard at it? Does he read the scriptures? Does he read the confessions? Does he pray? Does, does he give it his utmost and most earnest effort? And, and is he humble enough to recognize that he still needs to learn? Um, that's what I would look for if I was looking for someone to vote. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Pastor Matthew Gunia is pastor at Ascension Lutheran Church in Niles, Illinois. Uh, thank you, Pastor Gunia, for being on Cross Defense with me today. I'm going to close this up, but I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. And this has been Cross Defense, your weekly dose of worldview demolition. I'm your host, Pastor Jonathan Fisk, and I'm looking at my little list of, every time I'm on a show, I have to sit here and kind of take notes to give to Mrs. Sarah Gulseth so she can put all this stuff online and make it all really catchy and try to get people to listen after the fact. And Pastor Gunia, you know, he has just been a a, a plethora gold mine of great little comments. So which which do you think Mrs. Gulseth Seth is going to name the show? Is she going to call it the Law of Ice Cream Reprise? Is she going to call it, don't be a lawmonger? Is she going to call it, your pastor is not your professional friend? Or is she going to call it, zigging with the gospel and zagging with the law? Um, all of that beautiful stuff. But in either case, let me tell you, my friend, as you work to discern the truth of what God's Word actually says, there's no question that law and gospel is the high art which you are totally given in Jesus Christ to understand, believe, live under, and confess. You've been listening to Cross Defense. We'll catch you next week.
Rock on. You've been listening to Cross Defense, produced by Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your support is vital for this program to continue. To learn about giving opportunities, call Mary at 314-996-1518. Or you can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO.